truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Matthew 25, 40. Hey, can we thank these guys again for that special piece of music? <laughs> I love the talent. Uh, I just hear a song and I say, I want that song. Can you do that song? And they do that song. So I'm, again, feeling good. We're going to do something special before I get started. Uh, Pat, would you come to the platform? This is Pat Byers. And uh, Pat is a great, great friend of mine. Uh, she and her husband, Harold, have been a part of my intercessory team. Uh, so we meet on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock before our first service and we pray uh, we have this strong sense that if God doesn't show up, we're in trouble. So we just plead with him, please come, and, and he does. But uh, Pat has been serving in lots of ways around this church for many, many years. Uh, she's involved uh, around the community and all kinds of things. Uh, she's involved with Transform Yakima now, doing great, great things to, to see the community transform. But she uh, began the process of getting her pastor's license not too long ago, and uh, and one of the reasons that I uh, said okay to that possibility was that uh, Pat and her husband, Harold, have been going after our first service on Sunday mornings. They go down to Wapato, to our Wapato Foursquare Church. Uh, Jeff Yellowal is the pastor there. They're ministering significantly to the Yakima Nation and its people, uh, which I have a great heart for. And I'm just so grateful for that. She's part of the teaching team, so she speaks to them. Uh, this is one great woman of God, and she deserves this. And what's fun for me is in our Foursquare license, it just simply says, License to Preach. So I'm very excited to give this to Pat. Can you uh, thank her for her willingness? <laughs> and because uh, we just love to pray for people, I've got some oil, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. If you feel comfortable, would you extend your hands towards her as I pray? Uh, for her father we recognize that a new season is opening for pat and i place this oil on her because we recognize that and uh, without you uh, she will not uh, accomplish much but with you uh, much can be accomplished and we want to release her into that uh, lord we recognize this call upon her life we recognize that this license to preach is truly that a license to to lead and to preach and to do the things you've called her to do so we again uh, recognize that uh, release her into the fullness of that ask you to do everything that you want to do in her and through her and cover her and protect her as she does these things i pray in jesus name amen Amen. Can we thank her one more time? Thank you. <laughs> you know, we're uh, during the course of this rooted in the last couple of weeks, we've set some people up in front of you on purpose because we're all should be asking ourselves, how do we get the most out of our life? I think whether we actually ask ourselves that question or not, we are asking that question. How do I get the most out of my life? Uh, Mike May was uh, born in 1953, and Mike, at, at the age of three, uh, a chemical accident caused him to lose his sight. Uh, it doesn't seem to have slowed Mike down very much because he actually, as an adult, set the land speed record on snow skis going over 65 miles an hour as a blind individual. Uh, Mike married, had two children, and 44 years after the accident that took his sight, uh, because of technological changes, was able to undergo an operation that restored his sight to him. 44 years later, and I think about that, and I think, you know, one, it'd be pretty crazy incredible to look on the woman that you've married for the first time, uh, your two sons for the first time, but the one that hit me was what happened when they took him to the top of that hill and said, yep, this is the hill we pushed you down <laughs> so that you would go 65 miles an hour. <laughs> and again, I think about that, and as we have... Uh, asked you all to think about doing this thing called Rooted as we encourage you to come back to church, as we challenge you with the idea that a disciple is somebody that loves God, loves people, and serves the world. Uh, I wonder if you ever ask yourself the question, what am I not seeing? Uh, what, what should I be seeing? Am I seeing things accurately? Am I really getting an accurate picture of who God is? And for me, if you're just checking out Christianity, which we believe people come every Sunday that are, 
do you ever wonder if we're getting it right? Or do you ever look at us and go, whoa, I don't want any of that, which we know you do. So again, am I being what I'm supposed to be? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Is my life being and doing, and am am I becoming what I'm supposed to? How do I get the most out of my life? Uh, So I'm going to answer and ask and answer some questions today. The first one is, why do we exist? Last week, uh, Chantal preached. She did a great, great, great job. And she talked about some misconceptions that I want to share again today. And one of the misconceptions is that it's about more than a personal pursuit of happiness. So for us, and she said this last week, it's not about me, it's about him. This is the fundamental way that Christians think. It's not about me anymore. It's about him. That happiness is actually a byproduct of me living this way. It's about him. My life is about him. I will find contentment as I live my life this way. When I die, I want my life to point to him. So it's not about our happiness. And the second misconception, that it's about more than getting into heaven. And she said this last week. I loved it, so I'm repeating it. The idea that the sole reason Jesus came was to save me from an eternity without him is impoverished. If that's all I'm living for is is access to heaven, then I'm missing it. And I love the song that we just heard because it says, I'm freed and forgiven, and I'm not going back. I'm not going back. My sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood, and I'm allowing him to show me what it means to be a man or a woman of God. Again, the the heart of that song. So what is the chief purpose of my life? What am I here for? And to answer that question today, I'm going to take you back to the book of Genesis. I don't know if you think the way I think, but when I think about what am I here for, I I go right back to the beginning. So what did God uh, design Adam and Eve for? I mean, was it just so they could run around naked and and sit in a hammock and and, and maybe say, God, would you bring me some of those seedless grapes, please? I I really like those seedless ones. The really big green ones, I really like those seedless green. Would you bring those? Is that what we were created for? And as God is laying it out in Genesis 1, he says this, God blessed them and he said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. We have responsibilities to fill the earth, to subdue it, to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and every and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So here's the bottom line of what I'm trying to tell you. We were created in the beginning to work. We were to care for creation. We were to work in the garden. There is a clear mandate for human beings. Work for God, serve him, and care for his creation. A clear mandate, and that mandate continues through every generation. And yeah, the world is broken, but it's still the mandate of Christ's followers today. In Genesis 2, God says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So why were we created? To work for him. We are the imago Dei, the image bearers of God. And he is saying, this is my creation. You are my image bearers. Take care of it. Create, I mean, increase what is already there. Subdue it. Care for it. So I guess if you think that way, you'd have to ask yourself the question, what garden has God put me in? What garden has God put me in? And you might say, my life is no garden, Dave. But let me challenge you with the idea that if that is your mentality, then you are living in the I'm supposed to be happy mode, and you will miss this. You come alive when you begin to serve. So what garden has God put you in? I started thinking about this, and I'm going to apologize before I even say this, but I used to say when I was in youth ministry that hell would be full of middle schoolers for me. (laughs) I mean, I, I, I can handle in doses a middle school group, but just in doses. So the idea that you would actually as an occupation, teach middle school, that is overwhelming to me to even think about. But if that is indeed the garden that God has put you in, 
You are there to bring beauty to the lives of those image bearers. You may be the one that points them to Jesus. If you're a farmer, then the land is the garden that he's put you in, but the people that work for you, the people you buy from, the people you sell to, the people that you come in contact with, that is the garden that he has put you in. If you are working in a barista, then every cup of coffee that you make is an act of worship, and every person you come in contact with is one of his image bearers that you have an opportunity to bless. People truly matter, and in the garden you are in, they should matter to you. So what garden are you in? And if you are seeking personal happiness, you are a con consumer and will probably never truly be happy and will never see other people the way God wants you to see them. In the Reformation 1647, the Westminster Assembly offered authored, excuse me, what was called the Westminster Short Catechism. They answered a whole bunch of questions. They entitled their work, The Humble Advice of the Assembly of the Divines. And their first question was probably their most important question. And that question was simply, what is the chief end of man? And the response was, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So why do you exist you exist to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that is how you will get the most out of your life. You work, you glorify God, and you enjoy him forever. Now think of it this way. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to save humanity from sin and to create a way for us to be forgiven and restored. And the thing I love about biblical restoration is that you're better than you've ever been. Better than you've ever been. Why else did he come? To begin the process that would heal and redeem a broken world that he loves. He loves this world. And his intention is to redeem it, every single one of his image bearers. And we're a part of that. In Mark chapter 10, he says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when you and I say yes to Jesus, and if you're thinking about saying yes to Jesus, to following him, when you say yes, you become a part of this great adventure of joining the Savior of the planet in this extraordinary mission to redeem and to restore the world. And he actually released and unleashed a power on the earth through his Holy Spirit to allow us to accomplish this. There are two holy, holy days in the Christian calendar, Pentecost in the Jewish calendar and Passover. Passover is now what we call Easter. It's, it's when Jesus rose from the dead. It's coming up on April 1st, a great time to invite somebody to come to church that doesn't go to church. On the Passover, again, Jesus rose from the dead. 500 people saw him in this resurrected state. And if you were going to convict somebody of a crime and said, I have 500 witnesses to this thing, people would say, I'm pretty sure he did it. I'm pretty sure he did it. So 500 people witnessed the resurrection and the resurrected Jesus. But the people who saw him still didn't know what to do, and they were afraid. And they had a reason to be afraid because the very people that killed Jesus were going to kill them. So they were hiding, they were in locked rooms, afraid because they didn't know their purpose. And Jesus had told them, wait in Jerusalem until I come. I am going to release the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit on you, and you're going to do the very same things that I did. You're going to be about saving and redeeming and restoring. So let me read this unleashing, this time that we call Pentecost to you and explain some things if you don't mind. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So again, they're in this room, they're afraid, the doors are locked, and all of a sudden in this closed room, this violent wind suddenly appears. And why would he show up in a wind? Why would he do that? Because wind is the symbol of the breath of God. 
When he made Adam, he formed him from the dust of the ground, but then he breathed his own life into him, and that's when life came. They were powerless. Adam was just a lump of clay until the breath came, and all of a sudden this wind came, and it was in them, and it was around them, and, and the power of God fell in that room. It continues, then they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. These flames, these tongues, what the author is really doing is having a difficult time describing what he's being told. But the fire represents the purity and the holiness of God. It was fire that did not consume the bush that God spoke to Moses to go free the people from Egypt. It was a pillar of fire that they followed as they came out of Egypt. Fire, again, a representation of the, of the purity and the holiness of God. And these languages that are unleashed, the primary language of the world at this point was Greek, but the whole known world came to Jerusalem during Pentecost, and, and as they're sitting there, they know Greek, but they're hearing these people speak in their own native ancient languages, some that they hadn't heard for a long time. So this was truly, again, this fire which comes into the room and, and somehow is absorbed into their bodies, and all of a the sudden they're released. And you see that at the end of the chapter because Peter, who was so scared that he denied Jesus three times, so scared that he went back to fishing, all of a sudden, he's standing before people, and here's what he says. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and all who are far off, even to those in Yakima, Washington in 2018. That power is available for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who had accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number, the power of God. From this moment on, people who followed God had an assignment to do what Jesus did, and they had the power to fulfill that, this renewed mandate that they were to be like Jesus, to see that People understood that Jesus came to, to um, forgive them of their sin, to find a way for them to be restored, to begin the process of healing and redeeming, redeeming a broken world and a, and a broken humanity. We exist for a new assignment. It's called the Great Commission, and all of us who follow Jesus are called to it. We've, we've got this work to do, and we've got the power to do it. But I want to close by telling you he also has given us gifts to do it. Each and every one of us has a gift. There are three places where the gifts are talked about in the Bible where we are gifted to accomplish this work. There are the ministry gifts in Romans 12, which I'm going to talk to you briefly about. There are the church office gifts in Ephesians 4, which I'm not going to talk to you about, but I encourage you to go read. And then there are the supernatural gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. And they aren't actually called super. That's not the right translation. It should just be translated spirituals. These are the spirituals that are given to you to walk in and to be a part of, and they are really, truly the supernatural, some of the stuff that we're actually afraid of. I'm not going to talk about those today because I don't have time. But this ministry gift, there are mixes of ministry gifts so that we, the Imago Dei, the image of God, can walk in what God wants us to walk in. So let me read this to you from Romans chapter 12. It says for this, By the grace given to me, I say to every one of you. Now, now who's he saying that to? Every one of you. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. How many of you know when you think you got a gift, you can get all puffed up and think, hmm, I'm pretty hot stuff. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Let me just say it simply this way. When we're all functioning in our gifts and working like we're supposed to, we look like God. We look like God. And people will be attracted to that. 
We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. There's the first gift. If your gift is serving, then serve. The second. If it is teaching, then teach. The third. If it is to, to encourage, then give encouragement. The fourth. It, if, if it is giving, then give generously. The fifth. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. The sixth. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. These are the gifts. These are traits that God leaves in our lives. And here's what I want you to understand about these gifts. They are just flat natural. I mean, you might have recognized one or two of them that you already know you have. And they usually are in a mix. There are certain ways that God creates people and we just operate and function best when we're doing what God gifted us to do. The first of those gifts is prophecy. Most of the time when we think of the, prof, uh, the prophetic, we think that somebody's speaking about something that's gonna happen in the future. But the reality is that only 10% of the prophetic uh, things that are talked about in the Bible have to do with the future. 90% of the time, it's just somebody who has heard from God and speaks into the present moment of those people's lives. It's somebody that speaks to you. It's somebody that speaks to a group. Uh, oftentimes, somebody that stands before people and talks and speaks or preaches is somebody that is bringing a prophetic gift. Uh, my daughter came to town to go to the IF gathering last week, and somebody at the IF gathering, one of the presenters, talked about this middle time in life where, where you just don't even know if God's speaking to you anymore, don't, don't know if your prayers are being heard, and that was the place that she was at, and this person spoke specifically into the moment in her life that she was experiencing in that moment. That is prophetic gifting. Serving. These are people that work behind the scenes. They just simply make things better. We have a guy that you wouldn't even know about named Dave Watson, who for 10 years around here just worked behind the scenes. Bob and Ann Jones. Uh, I, I just go on and on and on and on about the people who make this place happen. They administrate, they organize, they serve behind the scenes just to make sure things happen. Teaching. These are people that t take concepts and make them clear. As I thought about this, I thought about one of my coaches, Bob Gerritsen, who just took this difficult game of baseball and made, made things more simple for me. Uh, it, 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 he just had a way of breaking it down and making it understandable. There are people who understand math. <laughs> I don't get that. That, that is a miracle. There are people who can tear apart an engine and, and teach you how to put it back together. They're teachers. They know how to do that. There are people that understand computers. I mean, again, that's a miracle to me. They just help to make things plain. They have this teaching gift. There are people that have the gift of encouragement. They just speak life to you. You can be down and you get around these people and you just walk away feeling like, man, I could do anything. I could walk through hell with a squirt gun now. I'm, I'm just... I, <laughs> They make me feel so good. There are people that giving is their thing. I have a friend that 10% is the low bar for him. He wants to give 30, 40, 50% of his income. And not just that, I see him all of the time spending time with people, just getting to know them and, and giving his life and his experience because this guy just knows how to make money. And, and, and he just loves to give it away. Leading, strength, and courage. It usually shows up on the playground. A leader is usually somebody that turns around and says, hey, I, I didn't even know you were there because they're just following. People follow leaders. They, they, they look for leadership. Uh, Whitney, who stood up before you today, her, her uh, class in school said that she was going to be the next Amy Semple McPherson, who was the beginner of the Four Square Movement. And I believe that about her. People just like being around her, a leader. And mercy, I want to read this to you because I think we need more mercy in the world we live in. And here's what mercy is described as. They can see beyond people's sin and move towards their hurt with gracious sensitivity and compassion. They are filled with great wisdom and strength. They believe the best for others regardless of what they've been through or done. They reach those who are in deep pain or shame. They don't care where you've been. They believe that in Jesus you can overcome. You know, I don't know if you've heard this, probably not, but in Pakistan, violence has broken out again against Christians. And in our gift to the world, they've already built this shelter. And the, the man that we gave those dollars to to build that shelter is moving Christians who are being persecuted into those safe places. That is a gift of mercy being exercised. These are the ways 
that God created us. He gifted us. And you will likely again have a mix of these gifts and it is important for you to understand what those gifts are because when you exercise those gifts, you will be most satisfied and you will have the most impact on the world that we live in. So in other words, you will thrive and people around you will thrive. But I encourage you to remember that Paul challenged us to humility because your life experience can affect this and you can plug into these gifts and actually manipulate them. You can manipulate them and use them for your own gain. And I think many do. Many do. And we are truly interdependent. That description of a body with many parts. We're put together and when we're put together, we look like God. When you're all functioning, we're all working. When we're all doing what we're supposed to do, we look like God. So what were you created for? You were created to work. You were given the power to do it. And you were given the gifts to do it. I just heard this recently. I think the Academy Awards are being handed out in the next couple of days. The Screen Actors Guild, which is the, the, the union for actors, 90% of the members of the Screen Actors Guild are unemployed. Are unemployed, 90% of them. The most gifted people on the face of the earth, 90% of them are unemployed. Unemployed. Isn't that crazy? Did you know that there are 900 churches for every unreached people group? 900 churches for every unreached people group. And for me, when I hear a statistic like that, I wonder how many Christians are running around as if they're unemployed? How many? How much of the church is using their giftedness to bring glory and honor to God? And I guess the question I would ask is, are you? You know, that special piece of music, one of my favorite lines was, I felt the fire from above. I'm never going back. What Jesus has done for me, I'm never going back. Never going back. Have you felt the power? The Spirit infuses the church with courageous power, supernatural gifts, and a clear purpose. That's what we've got. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that this is a day that you have made. I thank you, Lord, that this is a day that you brought these people specifically to church. And I pray, Lord, that for us, each and every one of us, that we would recognize that you've called us. You've called us to yourself. You've called us to your mission. You've poured power out onto us. Holy Spirit, I am so grateful that you at work in us and through us. That that wind, that that fire is available to every single one of us that calls on you as Lord and Savior. And I pray, Lord, I pray that our gifts would be recognized and used to the glory and enjoyment of God. I always give this opportunity, if you've walked in here today yet to make a decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. Uh, maybe it was the music, maybe it was something I said, maybe you just knew when you came in here, that today was the day you were supposed to start following Jesus. Uh, so heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? That's all I'm going to ask you to do and say, that's me. Today I just know I'm supposed to start following Jesus. I see that hand over there. That's awesome. Yep, I see that hand. That's great. That's good stuff. I'm starting a party in heaven right now. Yeah, that's really good. Good, good stuff. Well, here's how we do life around here. We all say a prayer together. This prayer, some of us need to recommit to this prayer. Uh, some of you, it's the first time you've said this prayer. But this is how simple it is to step into a relationship with Jesus. So please uh, pray with me, everybody. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I say yes today to forgiveness of sins, to redemption of my life, to the restoration. You're going to make me better than I've ever been. And I say yes to that. I thank you, Lord, for your lordship, for your kingship in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Well, let's applaud with those that made that decision.